it was widely believed that no central bank would ever hike rates during a recession. You're supposed to cut them in order to stimulate growth. But that's not how interest rates work and certainly not interest rate policies. They are whatever a central bank wants them to be. And if they can get you to believe what they want them to be, then maybe fairy tales will indeed come true. The Japanese central bank has grown increasingly desperate. It's caught between an economy that's already in recession with little sign of it coming out and the wildly unpopular government in Tokyo, which is absolutely frantic to do something about the worsening predicament. Relentless yen weakness is a major factor keeping the Japanese economy from performing any better. It makes necessities much more expensive and has massively depressed demand for them if in everything else. People in Japan are right to be angry, just like voting populations all over the world. The past few years haven't been a booming economy or recovery. They were wildly mismanaged by bureaucrats who thought they'd elegantly solved a massive problem they themselves created. Instead, they unleashed monstrous economic and financial imbalances all over the world. The supply shock. Now the world is having to finally pay for it. The downside of the supply shock is it's just not pretty and it's not going away. So for Japan, the government wants to at least try corralling the yen to see if that does something positive. So it's having the central bank raise its benchmark rates and do some other things, all in the name of hawkish signals, to try to stop JPY slide even as the recession there continues. It's like King Canute trying to command the tides, where in this case the tides are the globally synchronized downturn cycle. And like King Canute, they have to make a show for it anyway. And what a show it was! Last night the Bank of Japan announced that it was raising its uncollateralized overnight call rate to 25 basis points from 10 basis points, or at least they were going to encourage the uncollateralized call rate up to 25 basis points. And in order to do that, they also raised the deposit rate to 0.25% to help encourage money rates. They're also going to taper the amount of monthly outright purchases of their Japanese government bonds, cutting them about in half down to a rate of 3 trillion yen, at least during the January to March quarter in 2026. Um, and they're going to reduce the amount by about 400 billion yen each calendar quarter to get to that level. The justification for all of these hawkish signals, tapering QE, QQE in this case, raising overnight rates to the highest they've been in 15 years, which tells you how bad it's been in 15 years since it's only to a quarter of a percentage point. But the justification sounds like economic justifications, like you would hear anywhere else. They're afraid of inflation. The Bank of Japan statement said, On the price front, although the effects of a pass-through to consumer prices of cost increases led by the past rise in import prices have waned, services prices have continued to rise moderately with a strengthening of moves to reflect wage increases in selling prices. Inflation expectations of firms and households have risen moderately, and that's overstating it quite a bit. The year-on-year -year rate of change in import prices has turned positive again, and upside risk to prices require attention. And you can hear and read between the lines, they're really talking about the Japanese yen. The yen is what raises import prices, and those import prices for the necessities that Japan imports feed into a whole lot of everything else. It's not inflation as inflation actually is. It's cost pressures feeding through from the currency's exchange value. And for once, Bank of Japan's Governor Ueda was somewhat forthright in his response. First of all, at the press conference, he said that the rate hikes, quote, we do not believe they will have a significant impact on the economy. You can, you can say that much. That's not really their intent either. But he also mentioned that and acknowledged for the first time, saying, we acknowledge the yen as an important risk that could move the outlook upward and saw it as one of the reasons for the policy decision. And let's be honest, it's the only reason. I've been talking about this for months, or ever since the, the idea of a rate hike first came up. It was never about the economy. In fact, as the Bank of Japan started moving toward rate hikes and then actually hiked them for the first time in March, the economy fell further into recession. So here's the Bank of Japan not just hiking rates once in a recession, they're hiking rates again because nothing really much has changed 
in between. That's how effective these rate increases really are. It's all about getting you to believe them, getting you and everyone else to believe in them so that Peter Pan can fly. But nobody's buying this. There's nobody's buying the justification that this is about the economy or consumer price pressures. Everyone knows this is all about the yen. I'll give you a sample here. Here's Nikkei. You wait to stress that the rate hike was meant to address the risks of inflation, not the yen's weakness. But market watchers believe that it was the latter that was the main concern for the BOJ because it's that obvious. Even the Wall Street Journal has figured this out. Here's what it wrote earlier this morning. The decision was the latest sign of a rethink among central banks about the effects of higher interest rates on economic growth. Governor Kazuo Ueda embraced a view spreading among Japanese officials that a rate increase normally seen as restricting the economy, could instead help growth by pushing up the yen and reassuring consumers who have had to pay more for imported goods. As I said in the introduction, interest rate policies were taught to believe down is stimulus, up is restriction. Now they're saying, well, maybe up is going to be growth and stimulus because of its effect on the yen. What they're really saying is interest rate policies are whatever central banks want them to be. And right now, they want them to be something that stops the yen slide. And then if it stops the yen slide, then maybe it'll be stimulus and economic growth. It really comes down to they tell you they're doing something that stimulates growth and you're supposed to believe it. And then you become the growth. That's how this is always, that's how it was always claimed to work. When, as I mentioned in a recent video going through the tortured history of interest rate cuts, especially around recessions and rising unemployment, it doesn't actually work because of course it doesn't. And the impetus behind this rate hike shifting policy nonsense is all political. Central banks are supposed to be independent. And the Bank of Japan was reformed in the 90s to become more independent, not quite completely independent because it does have government influence even on its policies, direct influence on its policies. But central banks are supposed to be largely independent anyway, not subject to the political interferences of electoral processes and everything else. The Japanese have an election coming up in September, and the ruling coalition is as unpopular as ever. So with consumer prices and especially the, the issue of the yen weighing on political fortunes, of course that's the reason why the Bank of Japan is acting in what appears to be such haste. Even Bloomberg noted as much when writing up the rate hikes this morning. By raising the rates soon after the ruling Liberal Democratic Party heavyweights called for a policy shift, I mean, how blatant was that? Ueda risked the appearance of having caved into political pressure. He doesn't risk. Everybody knows the truth here. And he came close to admitting it when he said, yeah, the yen's a factor, because that, it's that obvious. Continuing Bloomberg, the Secretary General of the LDP and the digital minister recently urged the Bank of Japan to tighten policy to support the yen and temper inflation in a sign of their growing frustration over the yen's role in driving up costs of living. And it's not just driving up costs of living. The yen is actually depressing the economy, which is already in trouble anyway, but it's adding another negative pressure on top of more than the Japanese people can really afford. So even though wages are rising, as we'll go over in just a moment, spending is actually depressed because the Japanese are prudently saving their funds, understanding the economic situation does not benefit them. The Japanese economy is in big trouble and the yen is making it even worse. We do see a positive effect on the yen in the short run, as is often the case with whatever intervention or official policy, be it an interest rate policy from a central bank or something else. Governments do have the ability to influence market changes and market prices in the short run. We saw that with interventions, the first one back a couple months ago. The yen strengthened for a little while and it strengthened materially for a little while before turning around and heading back lower again. In this case, the yen has been hit by a couple, a couple things in quick succession, which were likely planned out. First came the US CPI, which, which suggested that the Federal Reserve was gonna cut rates. And the Japanese government took advantage of that intervening on the same day to help strengthen that trend and to really punish speculators. But since then, in the aftermath of the intervention, which quickly started to fade, now all of a sudden the Bank of Japan was releasing rumors throughout the financial press saying, well, maybe we're going to hike rates in July. Not many people expect us to, but we're, we're likely to hike rates to because of this inflation story that we've come up with. 
And so the Japanese yen has been moving stronger a little bit here and there over the last several weeks in the combination of more threats of intervention from the government as well as Fed rate cuts, which are now becoming clear, which is part of the narrative. And now the Bank of Japan raising rates, which it actually did. As a result, last night, early this morning, the yen got up to 150.33, which was its highest since March. And while it, these interventions, the rate hikes, the hawkish signals from the Bank of Japan can have a short run impact, what's really going on is that officials hope that it triggers some kind of change and fundamental shift in the marketplace because that's all they do is, is affect the short run. To produce an intermediate and even longer term change requires a lot more than the governments have at their disposable. So they're hoping that it triggers something in speculators or the marketplace or that it just buys enough time for the market to correct whatever imbalances plaguing, in this case, the Japan's yen. Which, in this case, Japan's yen is being plagued by the downside of the supply shock, not something that can be corrected in a couple weeks or even a couple months, as its history has shown over the last couple years here. Outside of China's reopening late 2022, early 2023, it's, there's been no luck for Japan's yen. And of course, even China's reopening was just a temporary fantasy as well. As far as the economy in Japan goes, consumer price rates have moderated, except for the contributions from the yen. Higher fuel, food and fuel costs, although food prices are coming down a bit, higher fuel costs have restarted the CPI, the overall CPI, pushed it back higher. It's accelerated to 2.85% year over year in May and June, though part of that was due to the fact that government subsidies for electricity costs have were, had expired back at the end of April, and those are being brought back in August and September. But in between, the CPI moved up to 2.85%. Even the core CPI was 2.67% in June versus 2.58% in May, so it accelerated a little bit, but their core CPI only excludes fresh food prices. When you exclude both fresh food and energy, therefore the impact of the yen, prices are going in the other direction, disinflation. The month over month change in the CPI, excluding uh, fresh food and energy was just 0%, so no change in, in June, and it had only been up one tenth of a percent in May. And the year over year rate as of June was 2.11%, which is the lowest of the cycle so far. So again, the yen, not inflation. But as far as household spending, the household situation, the, uh, the idea that the households are going to lead some economic resurgence and, and turn the Japanese economy into an inflationary spiral, there's just no evidence for it. That's why nobody believes it, because there is no evidence for it. First of all, Japan's in a recession. You can see that from household spending in particular. But household income is where it's supposed to start. And according to the Japanese government figures on household income, disposable personal income, Nominal terms, the disposable personal income has been rising since last May. But even since, even though it's been rising for over, a little over a year here, or exactly a year here, because these figures only go through May 2024, it still has only brought the incomes up to 2022 levels. And real disposable personal income has been flat since January this year, well below 2022. In fact, it's been flat in 2024 at around 2019 recession levels. So like a lot of places around the world, Japanese people are paying more. They're receiving more in incomes, but they're also paying more to get less. That's why real incomes continue to be flat, to, to really lower. And so Japanese people aren't spending it because there's, their real situation is actually getting worse, not better, even as nominal incomes are going up. So nominal spending, that's also rising, but just barely, nothing like nominal incomes. Japan, Japanese people are more likely to save. There's no surge in spending anywhere. And in real terms, spending consumption, that's been moving lower since late last year. And really before them, you look at the, the GDP figures, they've been negative for four consecutive quarters. That's the recession in Japan. Households are bearing the brunt like they do, like in Japan, like they do everywhere else, of this supply shock burden. Maybe the most dramatic uh, illustration of Japan's situation, really the supply shock imbalances that were created, trade, overall trade. We're talking about yen, we're talking about imports and exports. You would think that with the yen lower, that imports would be booming. 
And they were sort of in nominal terms up until June. June was not a good month for exports or imports uh, for that matter. Exports were up 5.3% year over year in yen terms, but were down 6.2% by volume, including large declines with China and actually a decline with the United States. But it's the import side where you really see exactly what's going on here in Japan. From the government's perspective, the Bank of Japan's perspective, pissed off Japanese people's perspective. Imports have absolutely surged. Now they come down from their highs back in 2022, but not all that much. Imports in yen and yen values are still incredibly high. And in June, they were up 3.2% year over year. But by volume, look at the difference. It's enormous. I mean, talk about the price illusion. If you look at Japanese imports by yen, it looks like the Japanese economy must have been booming. But that's how much the Japanese people and the Japanese economy and the Japanese system has to pay over time for all of those price changes and yen changes. So imports by value are, are way up here and they've grown at a slower rate, but imports by volume are actually crashing. They're sinking. The supply shock was a price illusion. Volume tells you what has really happened the last couple of years and it looks increasingly ugly. And it's not just Japan. We see this disparity all over the world and that's the one the world is trying to, trying to deal with and trying to pay off in order to normalize after these last four years of artificial and massive imbalances. That's what the downside of the supply shock really is. Even some forward-looking indicators, they don't look like Japan's going to get out of its recession anytime soon. The widely followed Eco-Watcher survey saw substantial declines, really sharp declines through May, and only a tiny sliver of a rebound in June, particularly where it comes to Eco-Watcher's index on employment-related activities. That one has absolutely crashed, and it was basically the same in June as it had been in May. So forward-looking indicators not looking so great in Japan, but then again, this was never about recession or the economy at all. It's entirely about the yen. So there's absolutely no sign that Japanese wages and incomes are going to lead to some kind of spending cycle that produces a wage price spiral. There's no evidence for any of that. If anything, the evidence continues to show, despite the fact that GDP is likely to be positive in the second quarter, the recession is continuing, especially where it comes to household spending and household situations, which is why the Japanese households as Japanese voters are expressing their anger with the Japanese government. And the Japanese government has more openly expressed its anger with the Bank of Japan saying, you need to get on our side or else, or else we're all out of business here. So the Japanese government has pressured the Japanese Central Bank and the Japanese Central Bank is using its interest rate policies for something new because interest rate policies at central banks are only what they ever want them to be. And if they can get you to believe what they want them to be, then maybe they could actually work. But the real world doesn't work that way. And the real world over the last couple of years has had to deal with these enormous global imbalances that we still have to deal with. We still have to face, we still have to go through the downside of the supply shock cycle because it's still a cycle and Japan is a good example of it. And it's also a good example of how authorities are trying to deal with it and failing. People so often tie currency movements with interest rate difference, particularly policy differentials. And I actually did the homework and looked at the evidence and talked about that in the video link below. As always, thank you very much for joining me. Huge thank you. You're at all university members and subscribers. Until next time, take care.